Thank you. The first item of business is portfolio questions. The usual mantra, short questions, succinct answers, and we'll get through everybody. Question one, Pauline McNeill, please. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to allow young people access to cheaper transport and what its position is in the discounts that are currently offered by the bus and train operators. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to take positive and targeted action to help young people access cheaper transport through initiatives such as the National Concessionary Travel Scheme for Young People, which offers discounts on bus and rail services. We welcome the range of discounted fares offered to young people by operators, which are a commercial matter for the individual bus operators and on rail are offered under the terms of the ScotRail franchise contract. The Scottish Government is also seeking to introduce free bus travel for young modern apprentices and for young carers in receipt of the planned Young Carers Grant once it comes into force. Polly McNeill. On turning 16, a young person is welcomed into adulthood by asking to be paid full fares on all public transport. Many young people at 16 are still not working and at school the discounted fares the Minister talks about are not deep enough. Surely it's time to recognise that teenagers, 16 and 17 year olds in particular, welcoming what the Minister has said on apprentices and carers across the board need a fairer deal on buses, trains and ferries. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, the member will be aware that the National Concessionary Travel Scheme for Young People was introduced back in January 2017 and it's delivered through the Young Scot uh, Smart Card programme. Uh, it provides all 16 to 18 year olds uh, and also full time volunteers up to the age of 25 uh, with, uh, with discounts uh, on uh, bus travel. And there's also the, uh, the rail discount rail card as well, which is available uh, for young people. Uh, we're always keen to make sure that we try to support young people and be able to access public uh, transport. Of course, a very specific measure which the member has proposed is one which no doubt will uh, filter through in the process of which budget they want the additional money to come from uh, in order to provide even further discounts over and above what we provide at the present time. Question two, Alec Rowley. The presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in advancing the case and funding for a new Leave Mouth Rail Link. Cabinet Secretary. Transport Scotland is leading the transport appraisal work for the Leave and Mouth Sustainable Transport Study in close collaboration with Fife Council. Uh, the findings from the transport appraisal work will identify if there is a rationale for progressing the Leave and Mouth Rail Link. Since I last spoke uh, on the study in Parliament, the initial appraisal report has been published and stakeholders have been updated on the findings of this report at sessions in November. Stakeholders continue to be updated monthly by email and on Transport Scotland's website. The draft preliminary options appraisal report, which includes rail link options, is currently being reviewed by Transport Scotland and Fife Council. The final stage is the detailed appraisal, the timescale for which very much depends on the outcome of the current stage. Alec Rowley. I welcome the, the progress that is now being made and I hope that we can, we can see that progress continue because in terms of community support, there is strong support from the community. There is a recognition of the opportunities that this would bring, both economic and social. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he would be willing to meet with the community organisation that's behind the campaign, come to leave mouth. I understand he said he was meeting with one of the constituents um, SPs today to discuss that issue, but will he come to leave mouth? The one thing that these people are clear about is this should be a no, non-partisan non campaign. So could you come and Cabinet meet the other Secretary. one? Presiding officer, I've already given agreement uh, to the request that came from the constituency member to visit uh, Leaving Mouth. And actually, last week uh, when I was in Fife, I was actually approached by uh, a member from the Leaving Mouth uh, uh, Rail Group asking if I would visit. And I confirmed to them I'm uh, more than happy to do so. And I do recognise the cross party support uh, for this particular proposal. Uh, and no doubt, as the work is taken forward, we'll be able to identify what is the best option in progressing this matter. David Torrance. Um, to ask the Cabinet Secretary um, if he would like uh, Alex Rowley, um, if he would visit my constituency to meet members of the Leave Mouth cam Rail campaign and see potential economic benefits a rail link would bring to the area of high deprivation. Cabinet Secretary. Yes. Excellent. Question three has been withdrawn. Question four, Annie Wells. To ask the Scottish Government how it promotes active travel. 
Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has doubled the active travel budget from uh, £39.2 million pounds in 2017-18 to £80 million pounds in 2018-19 and 2019-20. The majority of this funding is allocated to local authorities to deliver high quality walking and cycling infrastructure, enabling people to walk and cycle more. Our funding also includes more than £10 million pounds to support local authorities and communities to deliver behavioural change programmes, including cycle training and increased access to bikes and facilities to encourage more people to walk and cycle. We have also recently appointed Scotland's first active nation commissioner, Lee Craigie, who will, who will become the, nation, the national advocate for the benefits of walking and cycling, including for everyday short journeys. Annie Wells. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It is estimated that at the current rate of progress, it will take around 239 years to reach the Scottish Government's target for 10 per cent of journeys to be made by bike by 2020. While setting an ambitious target is positive, and the steps that the Cabinet Secretary has already said, how will the Scottish Government ensure that the necessary support is in place to achieve it? Cabinet Secretary. You know, I thought when the member said 239 years, she was talking about the Brexit negotiations uh, in this, given the state of affairs. But what I can say is that we have a, a very ambitious programme in taking forward uh, driving up active travel. Uh, this was a stretch target which we set, uh, one which is very ambition, ambitious. We have seen progress uh, towards that, uh, but clearly not at the speed at which we would all like to see it uh, be made. Hence the reason as to why we have doubled the budget uh, in order to drive it forward uh, in the, the coming years. And I'm very much committed to making sure we do everything we can to increase the number of people who are taking active travel options when it comes to uh, taking journeys. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And while I welcome the doubling of the budget, I would like to highlight to the Cabinet Secretary that I visited the Community Links uh, Plus South um, City Way, um, which was supported by on a cross-party basis. And I think accessibility and visibility were really inspiring there. Can the Cabinet Secretary uh, tell us a bit more about how marginalised communities um, in these active travel opportunities will, will have affordable options? Cabinet Secretary. I, officer, I think the member raised a very important issue here because it's important, and I've made this point on a number of occasions now, is that in helping to promote and encourage active travel, that we are reaching out to those hard to get at communities and those individuals who may not initially uh, think that they are going to take up an active travel option. Uh, in my recent discussion with the stakeholders who are responsible for taking this forward, uh, one of the challenges I've put to them is to demonstrate in greater detail how they are ensuring that they're reaching into our more deprived communities to ensure that they are providing them with the options to look at greater active travel options. So, for example, where we've got social housing provision uh, being made available is looking at how we can build into that infrastructure the necessary provision to help to support active travel. Whether that be cycle routes or walking routes, can we work with uh, housing associations, look at creating e-bike hubs? Uh, can we also look at the introduction of, for example, uh, the provision of um, uh, electric vehicles through a, a car club model, which could be delivered through, uh, through, uh, through social housing as well. These are all issues that I've challenged them to go and look at developing in a much more detailed way, because I'm very clear about the need to make sure that active travel is not just about those who have got a predisposition to being active, but also to reaching out to those communities that are more deprived and more difficult to get to, to ensure that they get the benefits that can come from this type of investment as well. Question five, Jamie Harper Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government how Transport Scotland supports and promotes tourism. Cabinet Secretary. Transport Scotland works with partners. It supports tourism by uh, investing in our transport network to promote Scotland as an accessible and attractive place to visit. For example, Transport Scotland works closely with Scotland's airports to help secure new routes that improve business connectivity and inbound tourism, such as the Edinburgh to Beijing international route operated by Hanan, Hanan Airlines introduced in 2018. Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, another area in which Transport Scotland has direct involvement is the use of brown tourist signs uh, on roads. We know from Visit Scotland research that these are valued and that uh, Visit Scotland also said they play a role in enabling visitors to reach tourist destinations safely by car. Uh, however, a small business in my Highlands and Islands region has recently been quoted almost £50,000 by Transport Scotland to erect just four signs for their businesses. 
their business. So does the Cabinet Secretary think this, is valued, this valued scheme is sufficiently affordable and accessible to tourism-focused businesses? And if he doesn't, what action will he take to support those businesses to whom cost is a prohibitive factor? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Signed Officer, there is obviously a clear criteria for the use of road signage, but if the member wants to furnish me with the specific details that he's referring to, I'm more than happy to get Transport Scotland officials to look into the matter. Liam McArthur. Thank you very much. Does the tra uh, Transport Secretary believe that Transport Scotland's sanctioning of the replacement of the Ham Nouveau uh, on the Stromness Scrabster route with a freighter vessel with only 12 uh, passengers this capacity either meets the needs of tourists or indeed the local community in Orkney? Cabinet Secretary. I'm officer, I recognise that in some of the vessels there are challenges, particularly at key points in the year when uh, we see uh, visitor numbers uh, significant and increasing. Uh, we are continuing to look at how we can expand and improve on the ferry network within Scotland and also in the vessels which we've got in uh, construction at the present time. But I do recognise that there are particular challenges on points of the, uh, on the network uh, as a result of the increasing demand we're seeing both in terms of freight and also in passenger numbers. And we'll continue through the ferries plan to try to address these issues appropriately. Question six, Donald Cameron. Mr Cameron, you don't need to press your button when you've been pulled from the list. So, Mr Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update following the last meeting of the A83 Task Force. Cabinet Secretary. I chaired a meeting of the A83 Task Force on the 15th of November 2018. A full and frank discussion was had and I appreciate the opportunity to listen to local concerns. At the meeting, I made a commitment that the Argyllan region uh, would be prioritised in the forthcoming Strategic Transport Projects Review too. I also announced that we will review the potential for additional physical landslide mitigation measures at the rest and be thankful. I asked for Transport Scotland officials to report back to me by mid-February with the findings of the review in advance of the next task force meeting on the 27th of March 2019 to enable discussion of the findings at that meeting with local and regional stakeholders. Since 2007, we've invested some £70 million in the maintenance of this trunk road, including £11 million at the rest and be thankful on the landslide mitigation measures and the, old, the local old military road diversion. These measures have worked, having already successfully stopped landslide uh, material from reaching the road and keeping uh, this important route opened uh, on an estimated 50 to 60 days when it otherwise would have been closed. Donald Cameron. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. He'll be aware that as the winter snap uh, begins to hit the Highlands and Islands regions, routes such as the Rest and Be Thankful section of the A83 will inevitably become more treacherous. Given there's some scepticism about these mitigation measures, what assurances can he give to frustrated residents and businesses that they will be able to travel that route without fear of major delays or road closures? Cabinet Secretary. I'm surprised at the member's reference to scepticism because the uh, mitigation measures which have been taken forward are the ones which were recommended by the task force, uh, which includes local stakeholders. Uh, and that work continues to be implemented. There's some uh, almost uh, four and a half million pounds being spent on additional measures which are uh, being put in place. But look, the history of this site is a very clear one, uh, one where there has been significant problems as a result of uh, landslide. Uh, the mitigation measures have had a positive impact. They have not eliminated uh, all of the matter. However, for example, the catch pits which are continuing to be installed again will provide additional resilience and assurance in there and the review work which has been undertaken at the present time uh, by, the, by Transport Scotland and their expert advisors will inform us as to whether there are further measures we can put in place in order to mitigate against uh, further landslide risks on this particular route uh, as we go forward. Question 7, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government how many staff employed by Caledonian McBrain are currently resident within the Western Isles? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Calmac Ferries Limited is a major employer in our island and coastal communities, employing some 242 staff who reside in Skye, Rassay, Lewis, Harris, the Use, and uh, Barra. Alistair Allen. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Can he commit to uh, examining ways in future to further encourage more staff working for both Calmac and indeed the Government's Ferries Division? Uh, to be given the option in the future of living uh, and working in the communities they serve. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the member will be aware that uh, Calmac um, already proactively do take, undertake work in our 
uh, in schools in our island communities and also uh, at careers fairs in our island communities in order to encourage people to think about apprenticeships with them and also through uh, their cadet programme. And uh, Cal Mac are always keen to try to uh, seek to encourage local island-based applicants for uh, jobs with them. But I'm uh, always more than happy to encourage uh, more, of our, uh, uh, more of those who reside in our island communities to uh, consider applying for these posts and to uh, look at ways in which we can further support that in going forward. And I'll uh, ensure that uh, uh, my ministerial colleague, uh, Paul Wheelhouse, uh, gives further consideration to this issue and whether there's further measures that we take, for, as has been suggested by the member, uh, to try to uh, increase the number of people who live in our island communities who are employed with CalMac. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that, notwithstanding the valid points that my good friend and colleague Alistair Allen has just proposed, that the HQ of CalMac will remain in Gourock in my constituency? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, uh, CalMac uh, made a, a very firm commitment in their bid for the Clyde and Hebridean Ferry Service contract to retain their head office in uh, Gourock, uh, uh, Gourock and CalMac are an integral part, I recognise, of the local community in Inverclyde, where they employ uh, some 266 uh, people. But I can assure the member we're keen to make sure that uh, those communities who do have a close link to CalMac maximise the benefits from them, uh, not only in the member's constituency, but also in his uh, parliamentary colleagues' uh, constituency uh, in our island communities as well. Question 8, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government, when was the last time it met with First Bus? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the last meeting Scottish Government officials here with First Bus was on Monday the 14th of June uh, of this year. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that a growing number of my constituents have been complaining about the quality of the bus service from the south of Glasgow into the city centre. I asked First Bus to attend a public meeting that I had arranged only for them to refuse. Does the Cabinet Secretary not agree with me that since First Bus is receiving substantial amounts of public money, then they should be more accountable to the public and be prepared to listen to their needs. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I'm getting ahead of myself. The last meeting officials had was on the 14th of January, not in June of uh, this year, uh, if I can correct the record on that matter. Uh, I do regret the fact that Bus Fuss, uh, Bus Fuss Bus did not agree to attend the meeting which was organised by uh, the member. And I would certainly encourage them to continue to uh, pursue First Bus on this issue because it is important that they engage with local communities where they uh, deliver services to. And I know in the members' constituency, particularly in areas such as Castlemilk, uh, access to bus transport is extremely important in being able to access the city uh, centre. And I would certainly wish to encourage First Bus to engage with the member and his constituents uh, to look at addressing issues of concern uh, which his constituents may have and to ensure the service has been delivered in such a way that reflects the needs of uh, the local community. Question 9, Maureen Watt. To ask the Scottish Government what its initial assessment is of the impact of the AWPR on North East Transport. Cabinet Secretary. Transport Scotland will be undertaking an evaluation of the AWPR project in line with the Scottish Trunk Roads Infrastructure Project Evaluation Guidance against both the transport planning objectives and wider evaluation criteria. The evaluation will consider the impact of the scheme by comparing conditions year one and then year three and year five after opening uh, with forecasts made during scheme design and development. Maureen Watt. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. He will be pleased to note that we are already seeing a significant reduction in heavy goods vehicles traffic in the Peter Cooter and Torrey parts of my constituency and in Market Street in the centre of Aberdeen, which has had unacceptable pollution and emissions levels. Can the Cabinet Secretary say when these will next be measured so that we can see the environmental as well as the economic benefits of this government delivering the AWPR? Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. Uh, President Officer, I'm very pleased to hear that the uh, members, uh, constituents, are already seeing the benefits of this particular scheme on the ground, and the feedback that I've received certainly reflects that. Uh, the government's project uh, evaluation will include consideration of the impacts of AWPR against a number of criteria, which will include uh, economic, uh, safety, and also environmental matters. 
Uh, the local authority, though, has a responsibility uh, to consider issues relate relating to local air quality monitoring uh, and report periodically uh, on the Aberdeen air quality management areas uh, as to the levels which they have in those particular areas where monitoring has been undertaken. Therefore, air quality monitoring at a local level is a matter which will be undertaken by uh, the local authority. But what I can assure the member is that we are continuing to work with Aberdeen City Council in looking to progress the introduction of a low emission zone by 2020 in the city in line with their uh, programme for government commitment, which again is about helping to improve air quality within our city centres because we know of the potential impact that they can actually have on individuals who may have a precondition uh, which is uh, related to uh, problems associated uh, with uh, taking in uh, a, a contaminated air. Jamie Green, this must be brief. Thank you. Can I simply ask the Cabinet Secretary to update Parliament when this delayed project will be fully open to traffic and for the record what the total estimated cost of the project will be? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the mem member will welcome the fact that 85% of the uh, road is now opened and the northeast economy is now getting the benefits of that. Uh, the contractors have advised that they've completed the remedial work um, on the crossing over the River Don. Uh, they have still to provide assurances over the uh, remedial work that's been undertaken and the enhanced monitoring arrangements they're putting in place uh, for that. Once they provide that information, that information uh, will then be passed to Transport Scotland, which can then be considered for uh, opening uh, the final section of this road. But I'm sure the member will welcome the fact uh, that, the, that, this, uh, uh, that the majority of this road is now open. In terms of cost, it still stands at the £745 million uh, as the contract set out. Uh, and his member will recognise that the contractors have stated that they have made a claim. And as I've made very clear, any claim, which is not unusual for a major infrastructure project of this nature, has to be substantiated and evidence-based. And to date, the contractors have not provided that evidence to substantiate any claim. Therefore, it still stands at the present financial cost. Thank you. I have to move on to the next section of questions. I apologise to Gail Ross for not reaching a question. Justice in the Law Office questions. Number one, Andy Whiteman, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many proceedings have been raised against Scottish Limited Partnerships for failure to comply with the Scottish Partnerships Register of People with Significant Control Regulations 2017 and how many convictions there were. Lord Advocate. Uh, as at last Friday, the Crown had received no reports of alleged offences under the 2017 regulations and accordingly the Crown in Scotland has not raised any proceedings under those regulations. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Lord Advocate for that answer. As of 10th December 2018, according to work undertaken by investigative journalist Richard Smith, of 18,000 active SLPs, just over 2,700 had not submitted any information. As the Lord Advocate is aware, this is an offence. And in a written answer from him on 19th March 2018, he said that over the last 10 years there had been no prosecutions for failure to meet statutory provisions. He also said that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service has recognised Companies House as a specialist reporting agency and is working with them to facilitate the reporting of alleged offences. What progress has been made with this work and are any prosecutions anticipated as a consequence given the offences are very evident? Lord Advocate. Um, <clears throat> uh, there, have been, there have been a number of cases reported to the Crown um, since that question uh, was asked and answered under Section 451 of the Companies Act 2006 by Companies House, and those cases are currently being considered. The Crown continues to work and there is continuing engagement with Companies House with a view to facilitating the reporting of other alleged offences, including those under the 2017 uh, regulations. Um, it's a matter of the company's house as the specialist reporting agency to uh, determine its approach to enforcement of the regulations. Rona Mackay. Uh, all steps to improve transparency around the SLPs are, of course, welcome. Does the Lord Advocate agree that the proposed reforms announced by the UK Government in December last year snuck out under the cloud of Brexit chaos still falls far short of what is necessary to close the many loopholes which exist. Lord Advocate. Uh, that's a question which will be more appropriate to direct to uh, Mr Mackay. Um, questions of substance about the uh, proposed reforms to the, to, to the law are matters for him. I can deal with issues relating to the investigation and prosecution of alleged offences under the regulations. Indeed, Lord Advocate. Question two, Peter Chapman, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will next publish the police strength statistics for Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the next edition in the series, Police Officer Quarterly Strength Scotland, uh, thir uh, Scotland 31 December 2018, will be published on Tuesday, uh, the 5th of February uh, at 9.30 a.m. In line with the requirements of the Code of Practice for Official Statistics, this publication date has been announced via the Scottish Government's official statistics forthcoming publications webpage. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The latest police numbers show that the number of local divisional officers in the North East has been cut by 42 officers in the last year alone. This is a clear demonstration of the SNP's policy of centralization to the detriment of communities in my region. Can he assure me I won't discover further reductions in the next set of statistics? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I just on the local issue say that local policing in the North East Division uh, has uh, 1,158 full-time police officers uh, as at 30 September 2018. That's an increase uh, of 2.3% uh, since 2013. But I have to say, presiding officer, the lack of self-awareness from Peter Chapman on asking this question. When in the SNP's uh, Scottish government-led Scottish government, we have 913 more officers than we had in 2007. That is compared to the Conservative-led UK government, which has utterly decimated police services. Yeah, yeah. In England and Wales, 20,000 less officers. Yep. Yep. That's a reduction of 13%. Just to put that into numbers, yep. in Scotland we have 32 officers per 10,000. Mm -hmm. uh, in England and Wales, that is 21 officers per 10,000 in England and Wales. So I would just say to the member, perhaps a little bit of self-awareness uh, is necessary when asking uh, these questions. And perhaps as we get into burn season, uh, he may want to be reminded of those famous verses, oh, would sound power the gift they gave us to see ourselves as others see us. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, presiding officer, and I'll resist the temptation of quoting Burns in uh, my question. Uh, but Edinburgh Council is currently planning to cut the £2.6 million it provides at uh, the police directly, which fund 54 additional community-based officers in the capital. Does the minister know the total number of officers that are funded directly by local authorities? And what impact does he think that the reductions in local authority spending over the last few years will have on the level of community-based officers in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I say a couple of things uh, to the member? He and I discussed this at uh, the last or previous session of, of the Justice Committee. It would be for the local authority to decide how to spend uh, its resource, uh, I would say, and of course, uh, he, he is uh, free to uh, argue otherwise that, of course, uh, local authorities uh, in the upcoming budget have a very fair settlement. Indeed, now, if he thinks that that is not the case, it is incumbent on his party to come forward with proposals on uh, where, uh, of course, we'd have to remove money from the budget uh, to increase local government budget. Now, I understand uh, he will, uh, no doubt, and his party will engage in that process. But we are treating uh, police uh, in terms of their invest, uh, in terms of our investment, uh, very fairly, not just fairly, uh, but I would say very well, with uh, a revenue protection plus a 52% increase uh, in their capital budget. So we'll continue to invest in the police, invest in local government. If he thinks there should be a change to that in terms of the budget, I would say to him and his colleagues to engage positively in the budget process. Question three, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government what the Lord Advocate's position is on his competency to authorise another referendum on Scottish independence without another Section 30 order. Minister Graham Day. Presiding officer, by long-standing convention, the content of any legal advice received by the government is, of course, confidential. Mike Rumbles. Well, what a poor response that was, presiding officer. In the, in the spirit of openness, in the spirit of openness and transparency, which this parliament prides itself on, uh, does the minister not agree with me? Uh, just as Scottish ministers demanded, demanded the UK government publish its legal advice on Brexit, and it was published, the Lord Advocate's advice on an independence referendum should indeed be published by Scottish ministers. And I see the Lord Advocate is present. It would have been helpful if perhaps the Lord Advocate had given us, us the benefit of his advice. Uh, uh, Minister. Officer, in the spirit of your oft-repeated plea that ministers and members should avoid extending these exchanges unnecessarily, I would refer the member to my previous answer, but in so doing, point out that the convention I refer to is so long-standing, it goes, I believe, all the way back to when the Lib Dems were part of the then coalition executive, quite some time ago, of course, which is why perhaps the existence of the convention has left Mr Rumble's memory. 
Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Is it the Scottish Government's view that this Parliament could, pass, could lawfully pass legislation authorising an independence referendum without a Section 30 order or not? Yes or no? Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, I have to refer the member to my earlier answer. Question four, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve relations between the Kurdish community and the police. Cabinet Secretary. Police Scotland is committed to building positive relationships with all of Scotland's communities. Responsibility for this uh, lies with the Chief Constable. However, the Scottish Government understands that Police Scotland have engaged recently with representatives of the Kurdish community to address concerns which have been raised by some members of that community. I also understand that Police Scotland have directly engaged uh, with the member in his capacity as co-convener uh, of this Parliament's cross-party group on Kurdistan. Ross Geer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. He might be aware that police operations over recent years have resulted in a situation where members of the Kurdish community are now afraid to attend their own community centre and will no longer send their children to language and dancing classes for fear of being monitored. This is obviously an unacceptable and unsustainable situation. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree to a meeting with representatives of the Kurdish community and the cross-party group on Kurdistan to discuss how we can improve relations and trust between this community and the police? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so what I would say to the members, I'm more than happy to engage with him and of course members of, of, of the Kurdish community. I couldn't do that on the basis of any live police investigations, you would understand that, uh, of course, but on the wider issue and to hear their anxieties and their concerns, of course, I'd be more than happy uh, to meet with him in his role uh, as, a, as a co convener uh, of that cross party group. Uh, what I would also say is that having engaged with Police Scotland over, over a number of years, over concerns that I had as a member of, of, of the Muslim community, as a young Asian male uh, growing up, having been stopped and searched on numerous occasions uh, when, in, my, in my younger days for, for no uh, apparent reason, uh, I know that it's taken time for the Police Scotland to build up that level of trust back with the Muslim community. That takes hard work, that takes effort, but certainly with the Chief Constable. Uh, that we have, I know he is utterly and absolutely committed to making sure those, that we have those positive community relations. So, uh, of course, he can continue to, to engage directly with Police Scotland. Uh, where I can assist in that, uh, or certainly where I can listen to those concerns, uh, I'd be more than happy to do so. Question five, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much Police Scotland expects to receive from the proposals in the draft budget and how it will allocate this. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Budget 1920, published on the 12th of December last year, contains funding of £1.2 billion for the Scottish Police Authority. That's a 3.7 per cent increase on the 1819 budget. This includes uh, real terms protection for the revenue budget and, as I mentioned earlier, a 52 per cent uplift in the capital budget for investment in modern ICT. But it is, of course, for Scottish, the Scottish Police Authority to now set its budget for 1920, which includes setting the budget for Police Scotland. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will welcome the fact that police and, uh, pl the Police and Fire Service will no longer be punished by the UK Treasury, now allowing them to claim back VAT. Has the Police and Fire Service been uh, paid back the VAT that had been well, uh, withheld? And if so, how much has that been? Cabinet Secretary. Well, members will know, of course, that we welcome the VAT policy change that came into effect uh, in March uh, 2018. However, this does not address uh, the issue of that that had already been paid to Her Majesty's tre Treasury between 2013 uh, and 2018. So having conceded the principle of saying that it is unfair to charge uh, our service and only our service VAT, they have refused, of course, to pay back that £125 million for the Scottish Police Authority and around £50 million uh, for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Now, if we could all as a parliament, including, and I look specifically at the Conservative benches, agree to lobby the UK government to give back that money that they have taken unfairly from Scotland, then, of course, we can continue to invest in the police service, continue to invest uh, in the ICT system and continue to keep investing in, our, uh, investing in keeping our communities safe. Briefly, Mr Kerr. Very briefly, President Officer. Police Scotland has been plagued by financial trouble since the SNP created it, despite the Scottish Conservatives getting back the VAT and bailing out the SNP. The Auditor was clear, Auditor General was clear last December that if the IT system isn't sorted out, the force will remain in deficit. Does the Cabinet Secretary think the Auditor General is wrong? Cabinet Secretary. I always listen to what the Auditor General has to say. I also, uh, of course, uh, happen to listen 
to, to what uh, those south of the border are saying about UK government's uh, lack of investment uh, in the police service. Just to quote uh, the English uh, and Wales Police Federation, they say the UK government's austerity policies, which have seen police budgets, oh, they don't like this at all, but I'll continue to read this quote, it is the UK government's austerity policies, which have seen police budgets slashed by 19% in real terms. That is why policing in England and Wales is in crisis and our members are on our knees trying to keep up with the rising tide of crime with nearly 22,000 fewer officers. Compare that to Scotland where we have revenue protection and uplift of 52% in the capital budget, more police officers than we inherited and lower crime rates. I think that puts us in a relatively good position in comparison to police services south of the border. Question six, Edward Mountain. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether HMP Inverness exceeded prisoner capacity in 2018. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it did. The average population during 2018 was 113 uh, people. That's an average occupancy level uh, of just over 120 per cent. HMP Inverness, as the member will, will no doubt know, is a small local prison that manages uh, the requirements of the courts across a vast geographical area. Uh, the Scottish Prison Service supports positive relationships by, wherever possible, accommodating people in the prison closest to the home, uh, which has contributed uh, to that level of occupancy. Edwin Mount. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for their answer. When prisoner, uh, prisons exceed capacity, one of the areas that suffers is rehabilitation and the other is safety. Can you confirm that enough resources are being directed at providing sufficient warders and rehabilitation support to prisoners in Inverness and when the new prison in Inverness will be ready for use? Cabinet Secretary. Like I said, Edward Mountain raises a very important point. Uh, indeed, none of us want to see uh, over occupancy uh, in, in any of our prisons uh, and I addressed the question on this last week I think from Liam MacArthur uh, the fact that we have one of the highest if not by some measures the highest uh, prison population in Western Europe is, is, is to great shame and it's not a, a statistic to be proud of uh, at all uh, so he's absolutely right that does have a detrimental effect potentially in rehabilitation and I know SPS are very aware of that and we'll work hard to continue to fund rehabilitation programs and also look at alternatives to custody and what I would say genuinely uh, to the member and I know his UK government colleagues recognise this that short sentences do not have the impact on rehabilitating uh, those who commit crimes uh, and, and certainly we are better looking at community disposals uh, that are better at rehabilitating those offenders so when we come forward with plans to introduce a presumption against short sentences of 12 months I would appreciate him and his party looking at that uh, with genuine uh, open-mindedness and in terms of uh, the, the replacement from H for HMP uh, in Vanessa, I will send them uh, some of the details on that is within our infrastructure uh, planning uh, in the government, but it would be fair to say that the priority at the moment is the female custodial estate, then a replacement for Berlini, and then a replacement for HMP in Vanessa. Question seven, Claudia Beamish. I thank the presiding officer to ask the Scottish Government how its policy on dealing with hate crime is informed by the expertise of women's organisations. Cabinet Secretary. Okay, I thank the member for the question. There is a clear need uh, for action to, to be taken to tackle gender-based prejudice and misogyny. Um, we're currently seeking views on how best to tackle this uh, in Scotland as part of our consultation on hate crime legislation. As we work to develop the proposals within our consultation, we engage with a number of women's organisations, including uh, but not exclusive to Gender, Rape Crisis Scotland, Zero Tolerance and Scottish Women's Aid. Uh, the consultation was launched, as the member no doubt knows, on the 14th of November. It will run until the 24th of February this year. It provides a range of organisations and groups, um, uh, as well as members of the public, with an opportunity to share their views and inform what is included in the new hate crime legislation. I would encourage everybody with an interest to provide a response. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and um, certainly welcome the um, consultation. And um, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can give detail of how his government is engaging with women's groups, especially in rural parts of the country where women might be quite isolated and not necessarily members of a particular uh, grouping. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's a hugely um, important uh, point. As part of the hate crime consultation, we're holding a host of events uh, right across uh, the country, including in some uh, remote uh, and, and rural areas. I'll be meeting uh, alongside uh, the Minister for Equalities uh, and Gender, uh, along with a number of other organisations, women's organisations, uh, in March. 
uh, of this year. I will certainly speak to them uh, if they feel there uh, is a deficiency in terms of the engagement with women in, in remote and rural areas. I'd be more than happy to see how we can address that deficiency uh, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it exists. But she's absolutely right on the premise uh, of her question that there are undoubtedly specific issues that affect women uh, in rural uh, and remote areas. So anything more we can do uh, on that, and I can do as a Cabinet Secretary, uh, certainly uh, I will look to do. Question 8, Mark MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are in place to prevent disclosure of an accused identity from compromising the safety of innocent parties. Cabinet Secretary. In addition to the provisions of the Contempt of Court Act 1981, the courts have a common law power to restrict the reporting of proceedings where it is in the interest of justice to do so. It is for the court to decide whether to make such an order in an individual case uh, in appropriate cases an interdict uh, may also be available. Mark MacDonald. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that I wrote to himself, the Lord Advocate and Solicitor General, about a case in my constituency where a young victim could potentially have been identified inadvertently as a result of the accused's identity being disclosed. I'm grateful for the support that was provided to prevent that from happening. But there are other cases where this occurs. For example, in cases where the individual's identity and address being disclosed opens up the potential for innocent family members to face potential retribution and repercussion as a result of their actions despite the fact those individuals themselves are innocent. Will the Cabinet Secretary look at the issues around identification, in particular uh, disclosure of address details, which can often lead to repercussions and retribution being brought to the door of family members who have played no role in any criminal proceedings? Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. As an important uh, issue that Mark MacDonald uh, raises, I will uh, look at that. Uh, I do, uh, again, once again, say that it is, of course, for the courts uh, to, to, to make that decision uh, when it comes to uh, potential, uh, when it comes to, to, to particular orders, imposing orders, banning publications of, of matters mentioned uh, in court. But on the wider issue, he is not the only MSP that has written to me uh, about a similar uh, case to this. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, protections in place. But if we can strengthen them, uh, I would look to, to my colleagues, uh, such as Lord Advocate and others, uh, if we can look at uh, seeing what else can be done. Of course, we will uh, keep an open mind uh, to that, with which, well, whatever is in the power of the government. But I, I reiterate uh, much of this is in the power uh, of the courts, and rightly so. Thank you very much. That concludes portfolio questions. Can I, uh, just let me finish, and I'll take you. And can I apologise to Liam Kerr and Joan McAlpine for failing to reach them? Mr Rumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I rise to make a point of order um, that's focused on the role under the Scotland Act of the law officers, the Lord Advocate present with us today, and the Solicitor General. Now, the law officers are privileged to be the only two unelected people allowed to sit in this chamber. This was written into the Scotland Act so that they are here specifically to give their opinions and views directly to MSPs, to MSPs. Now, in my question, I asked what the Lord Advocate's position is on the Scottish Government's com uh, competency to authorise another referendum on Scottish independence without another Section 30 order. I didn't ask what his advice was to the Scottish Government. I specifically asked for his advice to MSPs here in this chamber. As I say, under the Scotland Act, they are here for that purpose. And what I find particularly annoying is that the Lord Advocate is actually present uh, and has not taken the decision to answer my question. Is it appropriate, I'd like to know from the Chair, is it appropriate for the Lord Advocate to sit in this Parliament in the privileged position he is under the Scotland Act and not address MSPs directly as was the purpose of the Scotland Act in the first place. Thank you very much, Mr. Rumbles, and point board one, I thank you for making it. However, as set out in Rule 13.7 of the Standing Orders, with a few exceptions that don't apply in this instance, oral questions may be answered by any member of the Scottish Government or a junior Scottish Minister. As the member is aware, oral questions are addressed to the Scottish Government, as your one was, and it is for the Scottish Government to decide who attends to answer each question. Sorry, I, you don't have a microphone. You have now. I understand all of that, and I accept entirely the position that you've just outlined. However, that my, my, position, my, my question goes further than my question today. I understand that the Scottish Government can choose understanding orders to do this. My question is more a fundamental point and very important for the Parliament. Why is the Lord Advocate under the Scotland Act here in his privileged position and yet has chosen 
not to answer the questions directly that he is here for under the I, Scotland I, Act. I'm afraid I did answer your point of order. Uh, the point of order was answered clearly. That's in the standing orders. That's the position, Mr Rumbles. You may be dissatisfied, but that's the rules of the Parliament. I have to now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement. And I'll give the front bench a moment to take up their places.